I try to get to Okay, we're back at day two of Node Summit. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com, SiliconAngle.tv, and we're proud to be at Node Summit for day two of live interviews, wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Yesterday, day one, we interviewed, uh, we've got about 20, 25 interviews of great entrepreneurs, developers, executives, really the thought leaders and the folks really building this new community. Um, and they're all geeks, but they're all in business to make money and, and uh, do some good for the world in the development world and build great apps. Day two is a little bit different here at Node Summit. This is what they call the Node Jam. And Node Jam is where all the startups who are really playing with Node and really commercializing some of their ideas and visions into product. Um, and so we've got great teams of people, great product opportunities, and the social, uh, community, if you will, is all here, and it's really exciting, and I'm proud to be here with theCUBE. theCUBE is SiliconAngle.tv's flagship telecast. We go out to the events, and we set up our HD studio. We talk to the most important, smartest people we can find, and we don't care if they're entrepreneurs, developers, executives. If they got knowledge, we want to extract that and share that with you, and uh, we're proud to be here. Uh, and it's going to be exciting, so today's going to be Pretty much a laid back, pretty much chill environment. We're going to talk uh, candidly with the entrepreneurs, what are they working on, and some of the hot trends and products we're seeing. So our first guest um, is Matt Rainey, who is the co-founder, founder of Voxer, and I'm joined with Clint Finley, who's managing editor of our new DevOpsAngle.com, our section on SiliconANGLE, going into the Node world and understanding the, the operational and engineering side of it. Uh, Clint, welcome back. Matt, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks. First time in, good, good to have you. I'm going to be a little loose, so let's just jump right in. You uh, have the company Voxer. It's been very popular. Um, as they say, you know, Naval from AngelList is here. He talks about social proof. Uh, you have some social proof. You have people using your app. So tell us about Voxer for the folks out there. What is it? What are some of the product features? And then share with us just some highlights of the uh, success that you've had just recently. Sure, sure. So Voxer is, you know, it's, we call it a walkie-talkie, and it's sort of, we're, we're trying to make a, a modern, like, more useful way to do, like, walkie-talkie kind of behaviors. Like, the, um, the, the issue that we're coming up, you know, that we come up against now that we have these mobile phones everywhere, like, everybody's got a mobile phone, it's like, you can have a phone call anytime you like, but do you actually want that? Like, increasingly, no. People find phone calls are, you know, they interrupt them. Um, it's kind of a pain when you get a phone call. And so what we're trying to do is um, get sort of the etiquette of text messaging, but uh, let you use your voice to do that. So it doesn't interrupt, but if you still want to be live, you can still be live. And it sounds complicated, but I mean, it's just like a walkie-talkie that works better. Before we get into some of the technical coolness of, of what you guys are doing with Node and everything else, which we're going to go deep dive in, Clint and I were playing with your app uh, uh, on Monday night, and it's really cool. And for folks out there who want to try to understand this product, it's basically a text message with voice. And for the older folks out there like me, uh, who know about Nextel, um, and you see people push to talk, and then you can just chat uh, with a talk, like a, at a construction site, or when you had people in the service business, that, that was a really great product. Uh, Nextel pioneered that kind of push to talk concept. Here it's a little bit different. You're doing essentially a voice message that's a text message kind of thing to oversimplify it. That's correct. Yeah, I mean, it is voice. Like, it's not transcription. It's not converting your voice into text, but it's letting you use your voice with the social etiquette of text. Like, it's not interrupting you, but, like, voice is really nice. It conveys nuance and subtlety and, and just character and emotion that you just can't get with text. And so people do want to use their voice, we think, um, and, you know, not just always type everything. Um, you know, voice is a useful way to talk to people, and it just doesn't fit in the sort of modern, you know, kind of 
uh, you know, w with the etiquette of, of modern mobile telephony. Yeah, I mean, we know, we have the cube and we have obviously audio and, and video, but you know, I get taken out of context a lot of my blog posts when I do a lot of tongue in cheek and people are like, what are you saying? Get offended. So voice gives you that natural feeling of that. Right. Um, and the other thing uh, that Clinton and I were talking about uh, when we were talking to some of the developers on that Monday night uh, meetup, uh, Thirsty Bear was, um, a lot of the times you get hyped up in products in Silicon Valley and developers and it's like an echo chamber of you know hype and, and fun sometimes. Um, but really the when you have when you hear average people say, Oh, I love this app, right. um, it's amazing. So Clint, share your story about uh, your friend uh, um, who kind of showed you and said you gotta get on this. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I have a friend who uh, well, you know, I I have been hearing about Boxer for uh, over a year now because you guys are using Node.js and React, and so you know the stuff that I've been following. Uh, but then I started hearing about it from from my friends who from your, aren't your non-technical. Yeah, friends, from non-technical right? people, <laughs> yeah. and they're yeah they're they're fanatical about it because oh, uh, cool. I, I had known about the app, but I'd never actually even downloaded it. And right. so now suddenly I'm hearing not from Node.js evangelists, but from uh, you know like print reporters and from um, uh, airline. Travel workers of like, all right, oh, this awesome. is great! I love, I love to use this app while I'm driving because I don't have to right, look at it, right, I don't right. have to touch it. So, uh, yeah, it's it's definitely gaining a lot of traction outside of the tech community. Uh, and I understand you, uh, you've hit some uh, milestone numbers recently. And yeah, well, so but before I deflect that question, uh, let, <laughs> me, let, the, <laughs> let me let me let me let me also uh, just say that uh, hearing something like that, like what you said, like oh, people are telling you about it, like. As a person who writes software, like that is the absolute great. I mean, that is why we write software. So it's it's super great. <laughs> so um, I just. Uh, All right, while you're happy now, time. tell us uh, right. euphorically the numbers. Like, it's it's definitely it's a, it, well here here's what you can see. You can look in the um, you can go to the iOS app store and you can look in the social networking category and you can see which has the usual suspects. Um, and you can see which position we are in and which position we've been in for what, almost a month. Um, which is to say, above Facebook, and I'm not to say, I mean, everybody's on Facebook, like, no surprise there, but the surprise is we have been above Facebook for a long time. Yeah. And, like, lots and lots of people are downloading this app um, in, in this country and around the world. It's very cool. Congratulations. I think you got lightning in a bottle. And I think uh, when we look back on this Cube interview, we'll be like, wow, that company really went on a <laughs> rocket ship. Remember us small guys when you're uh, right. famous. Right. Uh, but let's talk about the team. Let's talk about you guys up there. And you guys say you write code and you're really uh, happy about seeing the results manifest itself. Talk about the team that you guys have up on your, within Voxer and, and talk about some of the talent you have. Sure. So, I mean, we have, um, you know, we're, we're primarily engineering focused. You know, we have um, we have a lot of people uh, wor working on Node. We have um, some sort of Node celebrities. We have Danny Coates who did uh, Node Inspector. Um, we have we have Daniel Shaw uh, who has done uh, various things with uh, MongoDB and just well known in the community. Um, we're we're looking to recruit more uh, you know more people to work on Node, be, be they Node celebrities or not. But um, yeah, we've got uh, and then we've got you know some people working on on iOS and some people working on on Android and you know we're always looking for more. Cool. Well, let's talk about Node. We're at the Node Summit. You guys have a lot of challenges. Uh, we were talking last night with David Floyer, our, our chief IO researcher at Wikibon.org, and we were talking about IO, and it's a challenge. And we were talking about latency, and it's a constant chase, mm -hmm. the latency problem. So before we get into the latency um, deep conversation, let's talk about the challenges with your uh, application, and then where Node really came in to help you. I mean, because, uh, you were talking about the old ways of doing things. You know, you, you nail something down, a process, and you have it, and then you, you kind of don't fix it. So talk about some of the latency issues around and what Node does for you. Yeah, so we have kind of a, we have a funny sort of architecture in that we're trying to be as low latency as possible. Like, we're trying to be, be absolutely live as, you know, absolutely as fast as we can uh, get data through our system. We want to do that. But we also need to make a copy of it in case you want to come in later, if you have another device, or you're offline at the time, or or whatever, and so that has been basically like the, the big win with Node is that we can, we can shuffle data through our system incredibly quickly. We can hold open lots and lots of connections. Um, either be they very uh, short-lived, very low latency connections, or we can keep much longer-lived ones open to a database or, you know, or, or you know, processes writing to disk drives somehow. Um, 
being able to hold open all of those connections and has has been crucial to us being able to kind of scale this up and keep delivering low latency um, that, that we need to do. So it's it's been a big win. Clint, what's your take on this? I mean, obviously you're following Node and you've been following these guys. Um, what's your take on all this? Uh, well, actually, I, I would rather answer that with another question. <laughs> but uh, I, I wonder what role has, has Node and, and the rest of your stack, because there's other interesting things in the stack besides Node. Uh, how has that helped you scale? Because uh, you, you've been growing so fast, uh, and I can't help but think that you know, some of your success has been your, your own scalability. If people started downloading the app and it wasn't working, you know, the, the adoption, I, I imagine, probably wouldn't really be there. But yeah, uh, some people, work, people uh, have it. criticized uh, <laughs> yeah. Node as, as a sort of a premature optimization. Mm. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, I'm wondering about your, you know, you have what seems like a really scalable stack, and how, how has that helped you? So, well, yeah, I mean, as you say, like, if we couldn't have scaled it up, obviously it wouldn't work, and then people wouldn't be able to use it. And so we were able to, so... Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, no, it doesn't scale. Like, you know, you need something that can scale. I mean, it does. Like, nothing scales by itself. Like, you have to do some work. I mean, even if it, the work is setting up your, your, you know, web app behind a load balancer, I mean, it doesn't, nothing scales by itself. And so the, the work that we put into our application logic made it so that it scales with Node. The, the sort of... The, the real reason, like, to the first part of, of your, your question is, like, the, the, the thing that wins for us is HTTP, like, using HTTP for everything. And Node in HTTP, in Node, HTTP is a first-class citizen, and it's effortless to do HTTP, and it's effortless to do JSON. And so that's what we use as a protocol, and that's worked out really well. And because Node does so well at this, we are able to build up several kind of service tiers, you know, several layers of our of our application stack on the back end that all talk to each other with JSON over HTTP. And likewise with Reoc, that has been a big win because we can talk to Reoc with HTTP and Node does that really, really well. And that's that's been a big reason that we were able to able to scale this up. Okay. So what's next for you guys now? Obviously, um, give us a status of the company. Where are you guys at in terms of employees, funding, and all that good stuff? So, so we're in, in the process of, of, of raising some more money. We obviously, now that we have a lot more users, um, it's a lot more expensive. <laughs> so um, we, are, we are trying to, to And you're hosting this. all your own stuff. You're not in the cloud? Yeah, or are you on Amazon? In, or? in the cloud. I mean, what does that yeah, mean? We're <laughs> exactly. We are, you're not using Amazon, are you? We're not using Amazon. We started using um, Amazon because you're supposed to, and um, we could not get the latency numbers that we needed. It was too unpredictable and too crazy. And so uh, we went to SoftLayer and we got bare metal machines there, and that was fine. It was really good value for, for your money. Uh, for our money, but um, the problem was at the end of the day, Linux. Um, we have these weird I/O mysteries, these weird latency mysteries, and we couldn't figure out what they were. So we are actually moving our whole deal to Joint uh, right now, and so we've already in the in the parts of our operation that are on Joint, we've already been able to find some just crazy, crazy, just impossible uh, performance problems that we were able to kind of suss out with uh, the magic of, of Dtrace. Cool. So, in terms of funding, have you taken funding so far? Self-funded. It's been it's been self-funded. Right. So far. you're looking for a round of financing? Yeah, yeah. We're yeah. we're we're in the process right now. <laughs> I'm sure you're gonna get a lot of term sheets. Um, <laughs> I definitely invest in you guys. I really love what you guys are doing. I think it's exciting. I think you're pushing the envelope, and I think the app is just dead simple, great. So, uh, and I think it's got a lot of headroom, uh, possibly video, maybe. Oh yeah, abs video, you absolutely. Know. I mean, the the infrastructure supports video. We just haven't put it into the clients yet. Great. Um, so, I mean, you know, what else is coming soon is, like, browser client. Like, there'll be a browser version of Voxer. It's going to be awesome. Um, and it will sort of sync up with all of your content, you know, kind of like, like Gmail, you know. Like, you can get your stuff from any computer that has a web browser. It works the same with our, with our mobile phones. It's just usually your mobile phone's more personal. You don't usually share your mobile phone. But all, you can have multiple devices, and it all syncs already. And so we're going to add a browser version. And... Uh, probably some kind of a follower model. So I mean, right now we're we're symmetric like like Facebook. What about uh, like integration with Skype or something like that? Yeah, maybe. Um, I don't know. I mean, 
the thing that Skype does is they do really good phone calls um, over over IP networks, and our thing isn't really phone calls. It's kind of somewhere in between, like phone calls and and text messaging, and maybe maybe some. I mean, Skype yeah, has really I, I good was audio. Just, I just think about it because as uh, I. I live in Skype a lot for yeah, me, uh, me too. Honestly, so me too. <laughs> I was just thinking it might be nice to be able to get my boxer messages in Skype. So not not calls, but just get the notifications and be able to play oh, them. Oh right, 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 in right, Skype. right. Yeah, I mean, so soon we'll probably also. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure when it's going to happen in the in the long term vision, but we want to expose an API, you know, and so then. Eh, maybe we would do that. Maybe somebody will will uh, mash up uh, Skype and Voxer and and get you get you what you're looking for there. Um, but yeah, I, I hope to to open up an API so that people can build all kinds of interesting voice apps um, wow. using our our backend. What are you guys thinking in terms of like you know in terms of infrastructure side of it? In terms of um, we talked to the CEO of Blecko um, and Rich Screnta, and they told me that everything's an SSD for them. They're running a pretty mm. cool search engine, and and they're really doing a great job over there. Are you looking at the Flash and is your architect? Do you have any purpose-built kind of hardware? Or are you going to go off the shelf and get like HP Dell boxes or or you know that kind of thing? So. Right now, we use what I don't even really know what kind of computers commodity they are. Gear, right? it's just <laughs> yeah, I mean, gear. we ask no our hosting provider to give us computers, and then they do. But no, no special architecture in terms of I/O on the hardware side. We have, I mean, some one of our React clusters is on SSDs, um, and the and another one is on a, you know big spinning disk arrays, like because we don't ever throw away messages. We we let you keep your messages forever, and so that's a lot of storage. It uh, doesn't quite make sense to keep all that on SSD. Um, so, yeah, can, so those are those are in an ever growing collection of disk arrays. Yeah, you guys are a good prospect for the EMCs of the world out there. Yeah, HP EMC. <laughs> so uh, great. Except uh, maybe not because we're using Rioc to scale out our storage. And not, <laughs> we're not using a big SAN. Like yeah. we're just using individual computers to add more storage. We just get another computer with more storage, and yeah. Rioc spreads it out. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, Matt, congratulations on the great app, Voxer. Go to the App Store, download it, check it out. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be a big hit uh, with uh, everyone from kids up to adults, travelers. And, but no uh, further. No, no. The, whole, the whole world. I mean, it's okay. a global web, right? I mean, you know, you add in social capabilities yeah. like following, you can really create, you know, I mean, GroupMe's been a great app with, uh, you know, look at the shared, you mm -hmm. know, text messaging. It's just a matter of time before voice becomes that. And we come back to voicemail again. Yeah, yeah. I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thanks so much. We're here inside the cube uh, with Matt, the uh, co-founder, founder or co-founder? Co-founder. Co-founder of Voxer. Check it out, uh, voxer.com. And uh, check out the app. It's growing faster than Facebook and Twitter uh, in terms of the iStore. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I made that up, uh, Im implied I, that uh, from the I conversation. Th I think you could actually conclude that, but the algorithm is secret for the, yeah. I the App Store rankings. But yeah. we'll, we'll, uh, we'll dig into it. We'll be following that. We'll do some investigative reporting. Congratulations. I, Thanks I will so watch much. That. I'll watch that. Article. <laughs> Thanks for coming inside <laughs> the Cube. Okay, Matt Rainey with uh, Voxer, uh, with Clint Finley, and we'll be right back in uh, five minutes with more interviews. The Cube is this conceptual box, if you will, and we bring people inside of the Cube and then we share ideas, but those ideas don't stay inside the Cube. We explode that idea. We allow that idea to grow and grow, and it does. So we really try to own the whole enterprise technology space. I mean, that's what we're all about. We take analysis, we take publishing, we take news, and we take live TV, and we combine it together in a product and share that with our community.
no one's doing what we're doing. Uh, what we're doing, in my opinion, is the future of media, the future of television, the future of the internet. Video is an amazing, powerful product. So we work in what John and I talk about as a data model. People always say to us, well, how do you guys make money? We sell knowledge, we sell information, we sell data. So the problem that we, are, that we identified is about what we call big, fast, total data. Anybody can analyze a gigabyte of data. If you do a thousand gigabytes, that's a terabyte of data. You take a thousand terabytes, that's a petabyte of data. A thousand petabytes, that is zettabyte of data. So you are talking big data, lots and lots of data, and can you analyze it in real time as it comes in, right? The Cube is like we call ESPN of tech because we want to cover technology like ESPN covers sports. John has a great vision for what's going to happen next in tech. And so John is sort of that alter ego of mine that lets me see the future. We have a really amazing team of people that work with us. Michael Sean Wright, Mark Hopkins, you know, we've got Kim here today. We've got a team of people on our news desk uh, run by Kristen Nicole. So she has a team that help feed us the news of the day, what's happening, the analysis. We have a team of analysts and they feed us information about what's happening. And then, really importantly, we have a community, a big community of, of many hundreds of contributors. We love technology, we love, we love the innovation, and that's what we do. We want to create a great user experience. And in order to do that properly, you've got to really, really prepare. The Cube for the past year that we've been in operation has been very, very successful. And uh, you know, companies do pay us to come here. I think the companies who have bring us in with the Cube get two things. They get a third party independent resource to provide knowledge to their audience who are seeking it, this demand for the, for the product. And also complements their existing media. Uh, we're here at an event and uh, you know, the company has their own TV organization and they have to pay a premium for that. So we complement that by offering a objective, organic, third party, independent analysis of the event. That's why the top executives come in here. The Cube is a comfortable place. It's a place where people feel happy and are happy to share their knowledge with the world. And uh, we're happy to, to be ambassadors of, of that knowledge transfer. My entire career has been really built on relationships and talking to people and extracting knowledge from people, largely in a belly-to-belly -belly private forum. What theCUBE does is it explodes that to a huge audience. I mean, we've reached millions with theCUBE, and it's real time, it's live TV, so you've got to be quick on your feet, but you learn very fast, and then you iterate from that learning. So John and I play off of that, and we're constantly trying to up our game.
First time on the cube, baby. Rock and roll. Cube, Silicon Angle's cutting edge internet TV show where we're covering all the latest and greatest in technology. Today we're in San Francisco at the first Node Summit, a, an, an event dedicated to Node.js. And I'm joined today by the guy who literally wrote the book on Node, uh, Tom Hughes Croucher, the author of the forthcoming Up and Running with Node for, from O'Reilly. And also here with John Furrier, the co-founder or founder of uh, Silicon Angle. Welcome to the Cube. Well, what do you think? Hey, you You're guys. in the queue. We're relaxing. Mm -hmm. So you wrote the book. I wrote the book. Uh, don't write a book. I don't recommend it. <laughs> it's good that it's done. Yeah, yeah. It's good for speaking gigs, you know. You get the book <laughs> out there. No, but seriously, Node's been in such a huge success um, just recently, just rising really to the top of people's minds and, and hearts of developers. What's the phenomenon about why, why so fast? I think it's been really interesting. I mean, I, I spent the last two years uh, traveling the world talking about Node uh, for both Yahoo and then for Joint, um, who of course sponsor Node, and just seeing the kind of the shift of the developer mindset. Um, it, Ruby's been really popular. People have built a lot of great things with Rails, but it's no longer acceptable to have a slow app. Everybody wants thousands of users. Everybody wants um, real time, and you know that's the reason that people are, are shifting to Node because they need that high performance. You know, and and they need to be able to present a company that that can hey scale to ten thousand users, a hundred thousand users, a million users. You know, and if you look at the kind of uh, the kind of startups um, that are really doing stuff with Node, like Voxa, you know, they have millions of users making phone calls, you know, using the system, and it's like that's pretty incredible. So yeah, I'm really I'm really uh, amazed at the continued growth. So let's talk about that mindset. So this is something that people are trying to get their heads around outside of the community. Uh, the mindset, obviously, with I/O, we were we were talking uh, earlier with with Matt about uh, you know boxers getting that low latency number down mm -hmm. down to the bone as fast as they can. They're pushing the envelope on that. But it, talk about the mindset. What is that mindset? Is it all about just thinking differently around coding? Is it around more architecture? Is it systems programming, all of the above, multiple languages? What is that mindset that's different from where it was? I think primarily it's the architecture, and I think it's this, there's this fundamental assumption. Um, a lot of the architectures that we have have been this legacy that's come from like the, the batch computing days, like literally punch cards, where um, the, the entire architectures we've been using to build internet applications are based on these multi-user mainframes where you know, the CPU used to be sliced between the different programs for each user, and, and we no longer have that problem. We now have this problem where we build um, applications that facilitate communication. And it turns out that the networking piece is the hardest piece. And it can't get any better because even when we hit fiber, fiber is still constrained by the speed of light. We can't go faster than the speed of light. So at some point, you know, even if everybody has fiber in everybody's homes, it's still going to take, um, you know, whatever it is, 50 milliseconds to get from here to Hong Kong. We can't make that faster. And that constraint is this real constraint that everybody's been ignoring up till now. And, and Node really has made it easy for people to, to deal with that constraint, to take that thing and, and kind of create an architecture where you know, anybody can code in a way which, which doesn't care about this network I.O. problem. So it gives the developer more back-end-like capabilities with that constraint and uh, as benefits, it increases their range of, of capabilities. Uh, Matt called, uh, he had a nice line in our last interview just now, was it, he treats HTTP like a first-class citizen. Right, exactly. Uh, talk about that, that role. I mean, that's a protocol that's obviously standard. Talk about why that's now a first-class citizen. Well, and I think this is, um, I mean, again, like many, many languages have this kind of historic uh, culture where they, they've picked up a bunch of stuff. Java, JavaScript didn't have um, any real success on the server um, until, until Node came along. I mean, some people were using it for a few things, but you went to the JavaScript conferences and it was a few people doing a few things. With Node, we now have this large body of people that have suddenly embraced uh, a new uh, way of doing this coding where it's notice specifically been designed to serve websites. It's been specifically designed to do internet applications. So it's not just taking the, um, 
uh, you know, JavaScript as a language, it's saying, hey, we want JavaScript to do this thing really well. And, and Node's, you know, sometimes criticized because it doesn't do some specific general purpose application that Java or something else does better. We don't care. The thing that we're really interested in is this large problem that lots of people use the internet and lots of people use the web. And if we can do that one thing really, really well, then we're gonna you know, save or make a lot of people a lot of money. And, and create a lot of good things in the world. Yeah, so it's not so it's so it's diverse devices and connections. Yeah. And so you guys just standardize on that HTTP and the server capabilities. Right. Um, and, and I think this is kind of you can see that in something like uh, like LinkedIn. LinkedIn um, switched uh, their mobile services to using Node, and that had a, an extremely dramatic impact because the uh, the connections that mobile phones have, that cell phones have, is so poor. So in that context, switching that context has a much higher benefit than a different context, such as server-to-server -server communication. Are we really talking about the mobile web here? I mean, all the key themes and use cases seem to be high leg on mobile. I think, I think mobile's a, a really huge use case. Um, there were some really interesting statistics I saw um, recently that, that talked about the sort of the shift between the amount of users that have internet uh, through their cell phone device versus internet through their, um, through their broadband device. Um, and that's shifting in the US. It's definitely shifting in the emerging markets. So I think there's increasingly, there's, that's going to become an important topic where you know, most users have, um, especially in, in, in the, uh, the areas where people don't have internet, so um, maybe less affluent backgrounds, they still have mobile internet, even if they don't have broadband wide internet at home. And that brings up the whole um, mutually exclusive argument. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm on a mobile device, but also I might have three or four other connections going on at the same time, and the data needs to manage that. So how do, does that address w well in Node, and, how, and we were just talking with Boxer about that, that they got to save all the messages, someone's on a mobile phone, they also want to move over to the browser. Sure. Um, what's the back-end data flow look like? So, I mean, Node doesn't solve all problems of scale, but again, I mean, this is a key part of internet applications, is that um, a lot of what we do now is we shuffle data around. So, um, in general, if you think of an application like Google as, as a sort of the canonical web application, if I typed in a, in a search query, you know, for cats or something, and then Google went out and searched every web page for cats in real time, it would take a month for them to go through all of those web pages. So instead, they compute a search index, and they can return me a, uh, a result in a matter of seconds. All of that's about shuffling data back and forth. It's, it's not about um, the actual computation anymore for the user, it's about how do we go and find the information that we've already have? How do we go and find the information that's, uh, that's specific and is, um, is the information that the user wants? So it's stored somewhere, and it's how do we root to that information? So that's the real question. That's the real, um, the real problem that we're trying to solve for these, these sort of current up-to-date internet apps. Talk about the, uh, the impact. Let's stay on that mobile thread, because I think that really mm -hmm. is huge. And, and everyone now is shifting to mobile, so it's not just about web on the browser anymore. It's actually you got to have that device access point uh, connected. Um, obviously, it's a, really a two-horse race with Apple and Android. Where are these guys weighing in on this? And we saw a great demo from Brass Monkey about their gaming. Very cool app. Um, this browser doesn't work with Apple TV, mm -hmm. so there's issues. Apple, you know, not known for their JavaScript support, uh, you know, really well. I mean, they're always, you know, dicking around with standards and want to control it. What does that mean? I mean, is it going to LinkedIn is is it a bottleneck? Is it a problem? Not a problem? And uh, Android a little bit more open, less mature than Apple, but open. What What's, you think, all this? What's your views on all that? What we can see is that um, clearly. Um, the the sort of the cloud services are playing an increasingly large role in um, in mobile apps. So, for example, Siri as a as a, obviously a, a, an Apple product wouldn't be possible without cloud. Siri is simply you know it has some very limited on device capabilities, but really in order to do any kind of significant functionality, Siri relies entirely on cloud services. So. Um, the, the idea of a cell phone that's connected to the cloud is becoming this increasingly important topic where, um, I mean, for example, the LinkedIn app, of course, you know, we know uses Node, but um, it relies heavily on these APIs. So the data on the device itself is extremely limited, and it's then going to the cloud to, to do that. So we need to do that in a really efficient, scalable, effective way to support all of the users, support all of the different devices. And that's where Node really comes in. And I think, um, I mean, there's a, there's a company that I'm advising called WebMobi, and the, um, the idea is to build a platform which is sort of a, you know, uh, mashing up phone gap apps plus 
cloud APIs. And, and this, is, this is the kind of space where we're looking to um, make it easy for people to um, take an API um, and take those kind of cloud services that people rely on and then have that replicated into the device. Like, how do you, you, know, how do you um, pair those things together? And these are where applications are going, where we rely on the big data, the big compute, the big um, services that we put into clouds like Joint and Amazon and Rackspace and all of those places where the server farms are doing all the processing, but then the representation to the user is happening on the device that they, that they want. And the actual functionality of um, the actual functionality you can keep on the device is entirely dependent on this data that we're pulling in from these cloud services. So this this is the mindset yeah. that you're talking about. This notion that hey, let's relook at the architecture, leverage the fact that we have more powerful devices at the edge. I don't want to call them fat clients because they're really thin, right. but they're powerful and the CPU's getting better sure. and stronger, the network's the bottleneck. Is that, is that correct? What well, I'm saying? Well, I think this is the thing. So if I, if I this is my phone, um, I have an iPhone. Um, this is actually the, the 4, not the 4S. And the thing that's interesting about this is this device is like $800. Um, $800 of computing power in a server farm is just unbelievably more powerful. It, the, 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 the difference in power between my cell phone and $800 in a server farm is, is astronomical. And this is, you know, um, why would we, when we have these really powerful communications channels, why would we possibly constrain what we can do on the device based on the computing power on the device? Because pushing that small um, battery efficient uh, computing power to the device is really expensive, yes. comparatively. So what we want to do is we want to use and utilize all of this network infrastructure that we have. And with 4G LTE and like all of these other things coming into play, we're having more and more network capabilities. And nodes really sitting there in the middle, facilitating the communication between these high performance things um, on the device, you know, the fancy graphics and all of that, but shuffling the data back and forth between that and the high performance cloud computing. And you know, using Hadoop and big data to compute, um, you know, using many computers in the cloud cheaply. So that's that's the kind of the difference where it's like, yes, we want to do amazing things, but it's, we still need this thing in the middle to connect them. Yeah, and that's cool, and you can optimize that. But the question back to Google and Apple: Are they standing in the way, or is it not really a factor? Um, Android. I, I think it's less of a factor. I think, um, you know, we'd love to see Node on more platforms. I mean, obviously, sort of uh, HP put um, Node into WebOS because they really saw, you know, they really saw a value there. And whatever the success of that product, I think it's inarguable, inarguable from a technical standpoint that it didn't have a significant impact on that product. It didn't yeah. um, add a lot to that product. So I think what would be really interesting to see is, um, you know, uh, whether there's going to be some, yeah. yeah, whether there's going to be some more bets on Node, and certainly um, there are people that are putting Node onto Android devices in, in various different forms. Well, if the developer community continues to get the acceleration that it's getting, I'm sure there's going to be not just pressure, just just social proof to these guys that it's going to work. Um, just to kind of change gears on that thread, I got a, um, a message from one of our younger uh, readers and watchers, uh, entrepreneur, young guy, a coder. He asked the question: Should I learn Rails or should I learn Node? What's what? What should I do? So you got a you know younger generation of um, kind of CS guys and or mm -hmm. coders, not or hackers and CS dudes who who like, hey, I don't mind jumping in and learning four or five different languages, piece of cake. But should I learn learn Ruby first or, or Rails first, or should I learn Node? And I think I mean I would say that uh, I mean obviously sort of at Node Summit we we probably have a bias, but um, one of the things that's really nice about Node is that JavaScript is ubiquitous. If you learn. Node, then you're learning JavaScript. And if you know JavaScript, then you have this ability to work both with Node on the server and have this kind of high performance environment that's getting all the press right now um, for good reasons. Um, but then you also have the ability to, to work with that same language and build all these kind of web applications. And I think that's a, that's a really compelling argument for, for so, some of the younger readers is, you know, if you're going to learn something, learn something that's going to be reusable. I think it's going to be interesting to see you know, uh, Ruby and Ruby on Rails, um, how much that proliferates. Like, as, you know, uh, if Rails uh, continues to stay popular, then, then, you know, maybe it will, but, you know, is, is uh, Node actually going to be a really tangible threat to, to sort of Ruby on Rails and Ruby as the indie language? You know, as this becomes more popular, um, as Node has made JavaScript a more viable server-side language, you know, that may actually be a really tangible threat. And, I mean, to the point where, there are more people on GitHub that, that follow what's happening on Node than do Rails. 
And that's, the, I mean, that's pretty interesting con considering the, the relative ages of the projects. And you see similar things on Google searches and you know, other things. Hey, we're here inside theCUBE. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngles.com. We're here with Tom Hughes Crocker with Clint Finley, um, managing editor of now DevOps Angle, our new de dedicated publication to DevOps, which is Node, which is this new emerging greatness around cloud, new architectures. Um, having a fantastic conversation inside theCUBE, our, our flagship telecast where we go out to the events. Um, let's talk about um, your, what you're doing right now. So you wrote a book about Node. Mm -hmm. You're doing a lot of evangelizing and working within the community. Um, what are you up to now for uh, your, uh, your work? So um, I, I spent a long time at Yahoo building really large sort of big websites with lots of users. Um, and I, had, I, I was very lucky that I got to spend some time working at Joint with uh, Ryan Dahl, who created Node. Um, but uh, for me, it was, it was a chance to kind of go out and see what some of the other folks in the industry are doing. So um, I'm currently running a company called Jetpacks for Dinosaurs. Um, and you know, uh, using my experience and, and my colleagues' experience working on very high performance websites, and specifically with Node, um, we've been working with some really exciting clients um, that are building some fantastic things with Node, um, solving some really big problems. So um, um, earlier in the week, we've heard from the, the guys at Walmart, um, and Walmart Labs are really pushing the boundaries of what can you do with um, the resources of a large company to really innovate and to really um, take some of those, some of those things. So I, I can't you know, speak for Walmart, but certainly the things that the Labs team you know, are doing are really exciting. Um, and I, I, I think um, you know, the perspective that I'm seeing is that there are an awful lot of startups um, and existing kind of bigger companies like Walmart that are looking to, um, uh, to really take something like Node and push the boundaries. They're really looking to sort of, you know, if, if I'm a startup, how do I really um, kind of scale my users? How do I build a product that scales fast? And if I'm a big company, um, how do I take um, some part of my application that I have and how do I make it faster and more efficient um, and grow that um, and spend less on resources? Let's talk about startups. Okay, so there's a lot of um, young entrepreneurs here. We're here at the Node Jam on day two of Node Summit. So, you know, in the other room in there, they're presenting their uh, their elevator pitches and, and whatnot to the crowd of VCs and, and audience. Um, what's your advice for a startup? I mean, a lot of these guys are, we saw some students some from Brown and, uh, and Notre Dame and some other colleges here. We got some young hackers, um, some CS dudes. What's your advice to startups with playing with Node and around the development and, go, and going to market? Um, I think Node's a really good place to be right now, and I think um, actually a um, a lot of the, the VCs that are actually kind of looking at it um, are, are looking for people that are doing Node because they're recognizing that people that are doing Node um, have a technology skill that's going to be very applicable in the future. Um, and um, I think I've, I've, I've even seen now already that um, people that have, have done startups that have used Node, even if the startup hasn't been successful, uh, there's a person have become valuable because there's such um, a demand for skilled node engineers now. So I think there's a, uh, particularly for the younger audience, th there's a real opportunity there because node is becoming the next big thing very rapidly. Um, and, and you know, we've seen from, uh, just from the summit, there are a number of large companies um, hiring um, node engineers. Um, so, so there are really great opportunities based on this technology. Um, I think in terms of startups, um, the thing that's really great about Node is it's allowing um, startups to kind of pitch out of, their, out of their league effectively. So typically you don't have to raise as much money because you know, on a couple of servers from either Join or Amazon or whoever, um, you can host a startup that will scale to 10,000 people without trying too hard you know, with some simple um, technology with Node and, and maybe Mongo or Redis, so like a few things, and you can really start to have that first 10,000 users that's going to help you raise money um, without necessarily having to go out there and, you know, and spend, you know, your college trust fund or, you know, um, spend, you know, the money that you're, that you're earning. So there's, there's really um, a, a good opportunity now for startups to, to be really effective without having to necessarily get too much money. And I think this is kind of, this, this is a large part of what we're seeing with the, uh, the increase in angel funding, the increase of people that are 
um, getting very small seed rounds um, is because they are able to do a lot more without having to go and ask for a million dollars to, to buy a lot of server resources. And also, I would comment on that. I totally agree, by the way. We're totally in the same religion there, and, and it's really great, great for entrepreneurs, and it's great for society. But one thing I'm noticing with Node is that the scale point for success has increased, as you say, pitching out of your league, meaning, you know, when you get a prototype up and running, you get something out there, and then, you know, shit hits the fan, starts breaking, and you don't have your VC money, you can do more with, with this. Right. right, so you can actually do a little bit more back-end headroom, if you will, if you think about it properly. Right. Would you agree with that? I, I would absolutely agree with that, and I think this is kind of um, increasingly. I think what what you're seeing is that the the products that people are taking to investors are much more developed. They're much more sophisticated, um, and I think in general, you know, tools like Node are, are giving people the ability to really like push push the boundaries of, of what's kind of considered a successful pitch. Are you in the Bay Area? I am in the Bay Area. I'm based okay. in San Francisco. Well, we have uh, one minute left, so we want to uh, wrap up, but I want to just say really enjoyed the conversation. I think we want to do more, talk to you more with our DevOps angle as we get more into this. Um, just on a final word, what's your what's your feedback to the folks out there around what's the community like around Node? Obviously, uh, we're seeing great tight-knit gum bunch of people, small still and growing. What's the community like with Node? Um, I would say the Node community has pulled um, you know, some of the best people from a lot of other communities because they see this as an opportunity to really do things right. Um, and I'm really excited because I've never seen a community grow this fast um, and I've never seen one that's been quite so respectful. So I feel like the Node community is really embracing if you're not sure what Node's about. Um, try the mailing list, try the chat rooms, um, and you'll find a place where people will openly welcome you um, and really help you get started. I think I would add... Uh Respectful is a great word. I would also add professional. Right. There's a lot of professional and range of, it's not just one class of, of, of folk, if you will. Right. Uh, so uh, the you know, communities, uh, uh, respectful, professional, great stuff. Uh, Thomas wrote, Tom wrote the book. Thank you so much for being on the queue. Appreciate Thanks it. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in five minutes. First time on the cube, baby. Rock and roll. I think it's probably five or six times I've been on the Cube now. Right, you know, at first, the guys are just fun to work with. Pat, welcome back. Hey, always a pleasure to be in the Cube. <laughs> hey, I'm about to go on the Cube. You never know what's going to happen. I'm uh, a three-time veteran of being on the Cube. Uh, I hope many, many more. Chad Sackets, Chad, welcome to the Cube. Dave, John, it's great to be here, man. I keep coming back because uh, great, insightful questions from, uh, from uh, John and from Dave. What face-melting action have you seen here at the event? And I know there's a lot of it. It's a great vehicle to, uh, to communicate with a broad audience a lot of folks watch. Great to have you back. Good job. All right, Craig Nunez, uh, VP of Marketing at HP Storage. Thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. When people mention theCUBE, they, they're like, oh my God, I saw you on theCUBE. And they're all excited about it. It's, it's, a, it's an experience. It's not just information. They experience kind of what's going on there. It's like real time. It's like they were there. That was like my going to the pleasure. gym. Boom, boom. Legendary IBMer, CEO of Symantec, and now CEO of Virtual Instrument. Uh, great to have you on theCUBE. So for CUBE to be here at a conference like this, that's got 15, 20,000 people, and sharing that live around the world, that's consistent with the way the, the world is evolving. So it's a wonderful media, wonderful media. John and Dave are amazing. I don't know how they keep everything in their heads the way they do. Uh, it's a great format, and we're obviously seeing that this notion of real-time coverage and a real conversation is what's driving us as a company. And I, I said very seriously, when the questions and the comments that we hear from from them and from all the different guests here directly turn into the products that we build. Yeah, that was my first Cube and uh, I really enjoyed it. There was the rapid fire of questions. It made me think on my feet, but they were very thought provoking and really got me going on analyzing the, the greatness of Arista and the greatness of the Cube as well. John and Dave, the reason their approach works, they're not just guys you know, reading down the question list, right? Okay, next one, next one. They're, they're, it's a conversation, right? And it's, you know, they're going to challenge you. They're not going to sell for the, the marketing hype and the BS and all that stuff that the industry throws around. Come on, you got to hit him up on the HP question. A lot's changed at HP, some turmoil at the top, obviously, controversy. They're going to hold you down to 
the, the, the real facts, compare you to the choices our users have, and have you respond to it on the spot, right? Thinking real time, and so that's real talk, not just uh, kind of a paper interview, I think. I'm John Furrier with SiliconAngle.com, and I'm here with Dave Vellante. We are inside theCUBE. theCUBE is our flagship telecast. We go out to the events, extract all the signal from the noise, and share that with you. And great guest lineups. We've got CEOs, CTOs, with all the top executives, bloggers, thought leaders, venture capitalists. I'm absolutely stunned by, because I know it demands 100% attention for these guys to be up there talking to people about a wide variety of technology topics. I can't believe these guys can make it so many days in a row. So I'm wondering how long they're going to go home and pass out for after this. But it was incredible, they, they just do a fantastic job. If you're not having a conversation, then you're very scripted. And if you're scripted, then you might be getting the right words, but you're often not getting the whole meaning and the whole depth of the conversation to the fullest extent. I think this is a heck of a lot more authentic. It comes straight from the heart and the brain. Sometimes you might forget to make some of your points if you're not a real-time thinker. But I think from both from a participation and from a consuming point of view, it's much more real. Chris holds no punches. So I've been on a cube uh, a number of times, and I think that the interesting thing about, the, the, about being in that particular venue in that format, they introduced me as, hey, I, hey, Hoff doesn't pull punches. Well, they don't either, right? They ask really difficult, uncomfortable questions sometimes, and you can tell people uh, and the positions and where they are uh, in terms of what they're able or, or desirous to speak of, uh, you can tell where they are on that borderline between kind of just, you know, a honestly answering questions versus kind of glossing over them. And I, I enjoy being there because I, I don't want to say I'm outspoken, but I honestly answer questions uh, with, with the full intent of being able to be um, respectful to the people that I, I bring solutions to, right? If I whitewash this crap, you're going to turn me off every single time you see me on, on, on any venue, let alone, let alone the Cube. So I, I like being asked tough questions. I like answering them honestly, and that's a fantastic venue for doing it. Otherwise, you get on panels and you got a bunch of talking heads blabbing at each other, and it's worthless. Yeah, this was my first time on the Cube, and um, I really got a chance to get to know John and Dave, and, and they're really amazing guys. I mean, the, the knowledge that they come with, um, the topics that they could talk about, the people that they know, and just bringing it all together in this live broadcasting forum is just fantastic. I mean, I just love it. I'm like, I feel like a groupie or something, you know? <laughs> in, in this environment, you know, the social environment, the real-time environment where we're in, right, people look through the marketing fluff very quickly, and if it's not authentic, right, you know, they don't trust it anymore. So in this environment, I think it's a growing trend. Yeah.
Okay, we're back here live in San Francisco, California. I'm John Furrier with SiliconAngle.com, all the angle on tech. Uh, we have SiliconAngle.com, DevOpsAngle.com, ServicesAngle.com, and we are covering the emerging tech scene and we're live in San Francisco at the Node Summit Conference. It's the inaugural event where uh, Node.js is uh, really growing like crazy. This is day two. Day two is the Node Jam, and the Node Jam is where all the startups come out who are hacking with Node, uh, demonstrate their apps, get some funding, uh, impress the judges. Naval Ravikant from AngelList is emceeing the event, and it's just a great day, a lot of energy. Yesterday was day one. Go to siliconangle.tv to see the highlights we did yesterday live here at theCUBE which is our flagship telecast. We go to the events and extract the signal from the noise and share that with you. Um, right now I'm here with a startup called Cloudin and uh, Sam Bisbee, who's uh, from Massachusetts and uh, Rich Levin, Dawson investor, uh, a friend of mine. So uh, congratulations to get him to write a check. Thank he's you a, very much. He's a powerful, connected, cool investor. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, you guys are down there also with a table. You guys are growing, you're profitable. You got some fresh financing uh, to expand. Um, tell us about what Cloudin's doing right now. Obviously you guys are, are an example of success story on the web and it's great to see you know, Massachusetts based company kind of kicking the tires in the marketplace and, and doing well. But you got the profitability pretty fast, lean team, now you're scaling, growing. So give us the update on Cloud and, and uh, how you see this whole world. Sure. So. We're basically hitting, trying to hit the uh, inflection point right now. Um, we are trying to be the data layer for web apps. And when I say web apps, I really mean any app that has data. Um, you know, we have a, we're built on solid open source technology, uh, NoSQL, CouchDB, and we've been running, uh, we forked it, put Dynamo clustering into it two years ago. Uh, a couple of uh, MIT PhD physics students um, and they went through Y Combinator and they built a great service that we've been running at scale for two years. So I just posted a story, not to pivot too far off what the cloud and things doing, yep. I just wrote a story that Amazon just cut out the middleman with their cloud storage gateway. Um, so um, you find it a little weird that DynamoDB got a bunch of hype and AWS Storage got a small press release? Uh, no, because it's, we, first of all, I want to say that we welcome DynamoDB into the market because now we actually have some, a competitor and we love competitors, and uh, we love to mix it up. It's, we just see it as one big validation. Also, the uh, technical response to uh, DynamoDB has been somewhat interesting. You know, it'll be interesting to see what ac the actual pricing comes out to, the actual benchmarks that it comes out. Um, you know, we didn't have much success running um, our initial public clusters on AWS because of random outages, so that's why we moved off to and partnered with SoftLayer. As far as their kind of focus, I'm really not surprised that DynamoDB got more coverage because uh, Dynamo, the Dynamo white paper that they published years ago was really the first big NoSQL clustering paper that got a lot of traction, and it's named after that, so they like so it. So talk about your team at Cloudin right now. What's the makeup of the, of the core team, and, uh, and then let's talk about the market opportunity you guys have. Sure, so the core team, we're about 12 employees right now. Uh, it's traditionally been purely uh, Erlang gurus, um, really, really bright technical people, uh, some of which are from the Apache CouchDB committer team. Um, recently, we announced uh, Dark Shuttle as our CEO, and uh, we've been bringing on a few more people to build out our field and sales staff, and um, yeah. So let's talk about what it takes to compete in the market. Obviously you're here evangelizing out um, cloud, and you've got a table down there, great developer community uh, here, and kind of a business crowd, kind of a kind of perfect storm. It's not too much of a geek conference per se. You got JF Comp, which tickets will go on sale here pretty shortly, like today or tomorrow. Um, so it's kind of that crowd, but you guys have to compete. What is, and obviously joining with huge financing uh, is demonstrating that this, this fully integrated cloud, turnkey, making it simpler. What are you guys doing in that market opportunity? How are you competing? and your offering. How are we competing against joint? No, just in general, what's the market opportunity for you guys? What's your differentiation? What's your solution set? And what's your value proposition that you pitch to the customers? I mean, when, when we're talking to business people, which this conference primarily is, uh, we start to really talk about um, you know, removing the DBA role. And you know, it's not that the DBA role is going to disappear from monster.com. It's that we're trying to make it easier Oracle for- Oracle doesn't like that, do they? No, they don't. <laughs> uh, but you know, 
a lot of the people that we deal with uh, are running, Oracle. screaming, and crying <laughs> yeah. for Oracle, or you know, they just don't, they can't afford a hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you know, we're trying to be that kind of uh, agnostic data layer for any application where you know we can go in your data center, you can talk to our private cloud, you can come into our data center if you want to, uh, you know. We've got everybody with from free accounts who don't care as much about latency to you know real time bidding ad agencies where we've got you know we have to respond within milliseconds on the same uh, LAN. So it's uh, we, we are you onboarding developers primarily or businesses or both? What's your I mean because Joyant got that nice and Heroku made a killing by onboarding app developers and kind of prefabricating some of those resources. I mean, right now, as far as, if you want to talk about corporate strategy, it's not like we're going out there and whining and dining CTOs. Yeah, yeah you, know, you don't have the cash it, for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, you know, we're really trying to focus Maybe a few on, Red Sox tickets, because they're in Love's Fenway, but. Uh, right, absolutely, you know. no, we are Patriots, uh, which we will be winning the Super Bowl, by the way. Yeah, um, yeah. There's, we're really trying to go after developers now, and you know, high tech companies that are small, um, that being said, we weren't planning on going after enterprise, and yet enterprise has been knocking down our door. It's why they get it. They get it from a business prop, and they get it from a technical prop. Is it the scalability or the security? It's the scalability, but it's also the fact that we can get uh, updated, queryable data to their platform faster. Um, so, to use the technical talk. It's because we, CouchDB, even the open source version, has what's called incremental MapReduce. And this allows us to get you updated indexes within seconds instead of rebuilding your index over three days. So explain incremental MapReduce versus what people know about Hadoop and traditional MapReduce. What's the difference between the two? Right, so Hadoop, Mongo, any of these guys, even if you go to the SQLs, um, Basically, it could take you three hours or three days to build your index. That could be you know, primary key index, that could be any kind of index. You could be using Lucene. Um, incremental MapReduce, you have to do that initial large build of the index. After that, we are able to represent new updates to the primary data set into that index within seconds. And so that's, that's huge for analytics companies, business intelligence, really anybody who cares about data being fresh. So what, what do you think about nodes? Let's talk about Node Summit. Obviously Node.js is a rapid a, a rise in the, in the energy and multiple communities kind of coming together. Node community is dynamic, it's respectful uh, and, and very professional developers. Um, what's your take of this and opportunity for Node? Well, I think Node is just going to keep growing. It's, it's one of those things where JavaScript is extremely accessible. You know, it's going to be interesting because PHP seemed to have gone through a very similar life cycle. It was extremely accessible, people started to standardize on it, and so it's going to be interesting to see over the next, let's say, year, to see if the, um, the pool just gets really crowded. You know, PHP didn't do a good job of managing all the people who wanted to get on the bandwagon. Um, and I love PHP, I still code in PHP, but you know, not many people can claim to be good at PHP. <laughs> There's a lot of bad people on it. And so it's going to be interesting to see how the community kind of handles that. Yeah. Okay, we're here with uh, Sam Bisbee from Cloudant, a great growing company, um, classic success story. And it's kind of an East Coast success story, although they have a maverick investor in Rich Levendorf uh, from Avalon Ventures, also invested in Zynga, um, and a lot of the big you know, web companies, so he knows, he's been around the block on, uh, for many, many cycles. Um, so you got a really strong investor, great validation, uh, self-finance, well not self, well self-finance, some seed, uh, Y Combinator success story. Um, congratulations on your success, and, uh, and uh, good luck with everything. Great to come on theCUBE. Thank Appreciate you very it. much. Okay, we'll be right back with more interviews in a few minutes.
The Cube is this conceptual box, if you will, and we bring people inside of the Cube and then we share ideas, but those ideas don't stay inside the Cube. We explode that idea. We allow that idea to grow and grow, and it does. So we really try to own the whole enterprise technology space. I mean, that's what we're all about. We take analysis, we take publishing, we take news, and we take live TV, and we combine it together in a product and share that with our community. No one's doing what we're doing. Uh, what we're doing, in my opinion, is the future of media, future of television, future of the internet. Video is an amazing, powerful product. So we work in what John and I talk about as a data model. People always say to us, well, how do you guys make money? We sell knowledge, we sell information, we sell data. So the problem that we, are, that we identified is about what we call big, fast, total data. Anybody can analyze a gigabyte of data. If you do a thousand gigabytes, that's a terabyte of data. You take a thousand terabytes, that's a petabyte of data. A thousand petabytes, that's a zettabyte of data. So you are talking big data, lots and lots of data, and can you analyze it in real time as it comes in, right? The Cube is like, we call ESPN of tech, because we want to cover technology like ESPN covers sports. John has a great vision for what's going to happen next in tech. And so John is sort of that alter ego of mine that lets me see the future. We have a really amazing team of people that work with us. Michael Sean Wright, Mark Hopkins, you know, we've got Kim here today. We've got a team of people on our news desk uh, run by Kristen Nicole. So she has a team that help feed us the news of the day, what's happening, the analysis. We have a team of analysts, and they feed us information about what's happening. And then, really importantly, we have a community, a big community of, of many hundreds of contributors. We love technology, we love, we love the innovation, and that's what we do. We want to create a great user experience. And in order to do that properly, you've got to really, really prepare. The Cube for the past year that we've been in operation has been very, very successful. And uh, you know, companies do pay us to come here. I think the companies who bring us in with the Cube get two things. They get a third party independent resource to provide knowledge to their audience who are seeking it, this demand for the, for the product. And also complements their existing media. Uh, we're here at an event and uh, you know, the company has their own TV organization and they have to pay a premium for that. So we complement that by offering a objective, organic, third party, independent analysis of the event. That's why the top executives come in here. The Cube is a comfortable place. It's a place where people feel happy and are happy to share their knowledge with the world. And uh, we're happy to, to be ambassadors of, of that knowledge transfer. My entire career has been really built on relationships and talking to people and extracting knowledge from people, largely in a belly-to-belly -belly private forum. What theCUBE does is it explodes that to a huge audience. I mean, we've reached millions with theCUBE, and it's real time, it's live TV, so you've got to be quick on your feet, but you learn very fast, and then you iterate from that learning. So John and I play off of that, and we're constantly trying to up our game.
We're back here live in San Francisco, California for the Node Summit. Node.js is the hottest thing in the developer community. Rapid rise in popularity, uh, application development. Um, we're here with theCUBE, SiliconAngle.tv's uh, flagship telecast where we go out with an HD studio, talk to the smartest people we can find, uh, entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, uh, executives. We don't care if they have knowledge, we want to share that with you. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com, and welcome back. And, uh, Pleased to announce the new vertical publication called DevOps Angle, which is a new section of Silicon Angle dedicated to the developer community around Node, around DevOps, around Ops Dev. However, you want to talk about it, this is a phenomenon that is changing the guard in computing and computer science and coding. This new mindset, this new architecture, and it's really exciting. So, Node Summit is really the first event that really changes the mindset around development, where JavaScript and HTTP are at the front stage of development and systems design to build scalable mobile apps and web apps. So uh, I'm excited, we're excited at siliconangle.com to bring you the coverage, and I want to introduce uh, Charles Beeler, who worked behind the scenes investing in a lot of companies. He's a partner at El Dorado Venture Capital, uh, a very successful business over there. He's invested in Compellent, sold to Dell, and a variety of other companies. Um, Charles, welcome to the back to the Cube, Cube alumni. Nice. Thank you. Um, I see you've been working behind the scenes, financing a lot of the companies in Node. It's an area that you have interest in. You also know the enterprise space, you know the storage space. Um, Silicon Angle, as you know, has been covering the storage like a blanket. We're all over the I.O. concepts. David Floyer just wrote a manifesto around I.O. infrastructure. I.O. is used to be confined to storage and networking, um, but now we have I.O. issues around changing an architectural fundamental change in how code's being written, and Node represents that. So share with us your inner dealings and content that you can share with us around Node and what your experience is. Yeah, absolutely. So we... Uh we actually started this conference, and we started it because we're big believers in, in Node and really big believers in what Node represents in terms of the ability to start to deliver real-time communications, real-time connectivity to millions of devices at a time. So I started this with my co-conspirator, uh, Mark Lewis, who I know you guys had some news about yesterday, I thought did a great job with, and Andy Jenks, one of the guys who works with him, and we were talking last April about Node, and, and the conversation was, it, what's interesting about it, what should we do with it? And the agreement was, it was past this point of just a cool technology if you guys were playing with, and there were enough businesses out there who had actually deployed it, were starting to deploy it. It was time to expose that in a different way, so we started Node Summit. Along the way, I spent time with the folks at Joint, and uh, subsequent to that, ended up joining uh, as an investor, and I'm on the board. Uh, you just saw the big $85 million announcement we came in uh, to around just prior to that. Phenomenal company. Obviously, they're the ones shepherding Node in the in the community. I think they've done a fantastic job of really making sure it's a community effort, not a joint effort. It's the most important thing to them because their business is not about Node, but Node is one of the things that they see as a key driver to where their business goes over time. So, so Node Summit, obviously, um, obviously, we'll talk about some validation points because as a VC, you look, you see a lot of deals, and obviously, there's some validation here. We're going to get to that in a minute. Let's talk about Node Summit, the event. So, you know, we we've covered Hadoop Worlds and we've covered Strata, as we've covered. VM or a lot of other shows, and uh, this one has a nice balance between tech, developer, 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 but it's got validation in the business side, mainly because it's, it's moving so fast. Um, you don't have the tracks, it wasn't designed that way, so talk about why the conference was designed this way, um, just to kind of clear the air, because there's some people on Twitter saying, hey, no tracks on, on not enough technical side, um, but it was by design to put it this way, so to explain to the folks you know, the purpose behind the design, it's the first conference, there's a ton of momentum, um, and I don't know if you saw, but yesterday I called uh, the, the node category four hurricane, mainly because there's so much business interest and there's stakeholder in this, so talk yep. about that. So uh, we, we tried to be really clear when we started the conference that we did not want to be a dev conference. The NodeConf is a phenomenally good conference around Node. Michael Rogers, who's here, he's on stage later, and he, I think he's going to come speak with you guys, runs that, JSConf. We didn't want to do a dev conference. What we really talked about when Mark and Andy and I sat down was, Let's do something that tries, and it's not just a first conference, but in some ways it's the first time anyone's ever tried to do this with an event, which is let's bridge those communities. Let's get the dev guys here. Let's get the hardcore node community here, and let's bring in more of, as they like to affectionately call us, the suits, and talk about you know, not just what the technology is, but what's interesting about it and why enterprises should be and in reality are adopting it. And, and you know, some of it we got right, a few things will probably change next time around, uh, assuming there is one, but I, I think there will be. And, and it seems to have worked in that we're getting some of these core developer guys, the guys who DevOps Angle's gonna be covering day and night, coming in and saying, 
You know, I, I'm realizing my role here is I know Node, and I'm, I need to be an ambassador to a much larger community of people who are just understanding what it is. And it's just been fantastic to see the Node community embrace it. I frankly think it says a lot about the community in Node specifically, the way they work. And at the end of the day, and, and you've met with them, it comes down to the guy who started it, Ryan, and, and his personality is just one of the one of the most down-to-earth, casual people you ever talk to, very laser-focused on making Node something that works for everybody, and, and I think the entire community around Node has followed suit. Yeah, and I, we were talking earlier with um, um, Tom, Tom Hughes Crocker, who wrote the book on Node, um, that this community is a respectful community, but professional, right? So it's an interesting, interesting developer community because um, there's not a lot of mudslinging. There's some arguments and some debates here and there, but for the most part, um, not a lot of groupthink some contentious, good conversations, uh, but respectful and very professional. And so it's kind of refreshing to see in this you know, day and age of arrogance uh, sometimes around in, in, you know, you know, and people having some integrity here. So I just want to say congratulations on that. Um, Thanks. No, I, but, and, and on that, you know, the, and Tom's a great example of it. He's, he's a phenomenal guy. We've got him as a judge here, spending time. And, and uh, I, I wish I could tell you what the magic secret was. I think to some degree it's because the Node guys realize that the world isn't all about Node. And there have been some of these communities who over time have lost sight of what their main purpose was and, and wanted to be sort of all things to all people. I think you see with Node, they talk a lot about other projects, a lot of things that integrate in and work well with Node and are important for Node-based apps to work. And, and that's somewhat unique uh, with some of the other communities as they've grown over time. Uh, talk about the uh, validation now. So let's get back into some of the, your uh, working days with, within the community. You said you, you saw a node kind of arise on the screen, uh, on the scene. Um, companies are out there. Talk about some of the validation points. You know, you're an investor, you, you know, you're well educated, you look at deals, you can sniff out a good deal, you got good instincts. What jumped out of the screen on you on this, on this, uh, this whole segment? Obviously, um, it's growing. You can see the social proof as, as Angelus talks about. What's the validation points? You said, hey, this is a winner. Well, first I have to thank you for using investor and educated in the same sentence. We don't get that much, we appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> I had to weave that in there. <laughs> the, uh, so really it, it happened as I started to spend time with some of the people at, at Joint who already knew. Brian Cantrell is a VP of Engineering and I have known each other for years. We sat on a board of a magazine called ACMQ. A lot of smart people sit on that board, all of them smarter than me, and a great opportunity for me to kind of hear what's going on, hear what people are talking about. And as we started talking about does this conference make sense, we started to hear stories from guys who you know, were here yesterday. So Emerson. Emerson's a 100-year-old company that makes really boring technology you install in homes. But when you step back and look at it, and some guys came up to me afterwards and said, so that company could have the largest deployment of Node in the world on a device basis in six months. They're, they're literally re-architecting their systems in Node because they've seen the value of what Node can do in terms of the efficiency in sensors and in, in large networks with lots of nodes. And, and so those types of companies, Ericsson's and other ones here, you see Yahoo, you see eBay, both announcing platforms for developers heavily based on Node. Rackspace, who's got some folks here and running around, just announced last week some things they're doing around Node. So we're, we're just seeing some of these big companies come in and start talking about it publicly, and we're hearing about a lot of other companies, and since they've never told me this directly, I'll out some of them, Netflix. The first time I went and did a search in Google for, for Node.js, one ad came up and it was an ad from Netflix saying we're hiring Node.js engineers. This was 12 months ago. Netflix has done a lot with Node internally. They don't, I think, want to talk about it publicly, which is absolutely up to them. Bloomberg has done a lot with Node. They've talked about it somewhat publicly. They, they would love to have been here, and if we go to New York for the next event, they, they said they'll be there. Uh, some Twitter guys are here. I don't think they've got anything uh, out in deployment, but I know they're spending a lot of time with this. And, and frankly, and, and last night or yesterday, the Google guy didn't really, it was a no comment comment. I've heard from multiple guys over there that they look at Node in a number of situations to decide, is this a use case for it? So the, these large companies are adopting it in a big way. LinkedIn's been very public about it. it it's beyond just, hey, I'm hacking it and I'm a little startup in a garage, uh, which I'm sure we'll talk about more, but it, it's these big companies validating that this stuff's ready to go. There's a lot more work to do, but we're comfortable putting it out and having our customers use it, which is pretty compelling. What's your funding thesis as you look at startups out there? Obviously, you're seeing a lot of startups here with the Node Jam day two here at Node Summit, which is really all about you know the startup side of it, kind of a demo day, if you will, um, jamming on Node. Yesterday was the day one, was the, the official kind of the conference. Um, what's your investment thesis around the kinds of dollars you deploy? Um, and I want you to talk about it in, in, in two categories. One, the kind of capital you outlay in a seed, series A, series B, and then what you see as a duration of the financing, um, total capital you might put in. Yep, so we're a relatively small firm. We're 
huge, huge believers in capital efficiency for companies, especially at the early stages. We also are enterprise focused. So historically, capital efficiency and enterprise startups didn't necessarily go hand in hand. Node is a perfect example of things that are changing that are making that possible. You can get more done in less time, you spend less money getting there. So we're seeing companies where we can invest today half a million dollars, so Badgerville is a good example of one of our companies. Half a million dollars, four months after they launched that company, they were generating revenue. They generated more revenue in the first two quarters than they raised in those two quarters. And last year they had just a phenomenal year, raised a big round that Norwest led, we came in. So what we like to be able to see is really low capital needs on the front end, and it's an ethos between the entrepreneur who believes in it, the technology they're using that allow it, things like Joint where you don't have to buy you know, data center space anymore, you can turn up an instance when you want to, you can turn it down when you're, turn it off when you're done. Uh, it allows you to get capital efficiency through a much longer cycle of a startup. We see more progress in a shorter period of time. For the startups, there's less dilution and less money at risk. And then as these enterprise startups start to get to where they need scale, they have sales teams, they need to build, they, they do need to spend more money, they need more capital. So for us, half a million on the front end could be eight, 10 million overall, but the bulk of that money is going to come after these companies have been able to start scaling. And at Eldorado, we've actually been doing a lot lately specific to the enterprise space to build programs to help in, in, extend that efficiency through the sales cycle, work with channel sales, work with sales strategy, because we actually think it's possible to do things like Compellent, $56 million raised. We think nowadays you could do Compellent on potentially as, as little as half of what it took them from when they started Note 2. That's why you put all the big money in the $85 million round. You've got to spend it, otherwise you're not going to be able to raise another fund. The $85 million <laughs> round was an interesting well, one. Well, I mean, obviously, uh, as an entrepreneur, I'm usually, obviously, capital efficient with SiliconANGLE, self-financed it, uh, and uh, growing it internally with no outside capital. And we don't need any more money. We're cash flow positive and growing, and it's exciting. And I can tell you right now that technology will be an enabler to actually scale faster. And one of the exciting things that I see with Node is this new architecture change around IO infrastructure and that now with cloud, this opens up the mobile market for entrepreneurs to actually not only do more with less, because that was the classic cloud story in the web, but actually a person who builds an app doesn't have to be a total network guru engineer. So that gives them so much more headroom at the scale point for validation, meaning the revenue point and market acceptance, which as you know dictates venture investment, Absolutely. right? It's like, you know, the venture capital is the classic, you know, that's like the bank, you, only, you get big money when you don't need it, and uh, you can't get money when you need it. Uh, I don't want to go that hard, but you know how it is, right? No, so, it's absolutely but the, but the, the point is, I can get validation and say, I can have, you know, a million users on, you know, $150,000 in capital, or half a million dollar round. So, yeah, so I mean, I'm that's looking insane. Through, I'm looking through the bright lights right now at an entrepreneur who I know, <laughs> starting a very interesting company called Swift Stack. I'm sure he won't mind if I out him. <laughs> but exactly that ethos. These guys haven't raised any money. They've closed and deployed a customer already. They're still clearly in beta, but you can get so much more done in less time. And, and we're seeing it, again, it's across yeah. the board. The consumer internet companies have done it for years, and it's been a great trend. We're seeing the enterprise guys start to figure out good ways to take advantage of it. And all the stuff you just outlined, on the front end, those are the key drivers that we see. And for us, again, we're a small fund, so being able to do these small deals, being able to invest in companies that we only need half a million dollars for 18 months. You know what? Fantastic. Yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't exclude you from our perspective. We, we it actually should, makes you more attractive. We're going to start a new vertical publication called Bootstrapped Entrepreneurs Only, and uh, it's going to be dedicated to all the people who self-finance. Uh, we're, who can't afford PR, we'll do it for free. We're big fans uh, of the trend. Yeah. Yeah. It is, yeah. and it's efficiency, right? Look at AngelList, right? Classic example of efficiency in the capital market. So Naval's done such an incredibly fantastic job, and, and, and we've, he's here today, which is great, emceeing, which we really appreciate, but when you really look at what he's done and, and what his objectives in it were, which are not monetary objectives, it's all about building a community. I've seen, in 15 years in venture, I've probably seen 40 different people come in and say, we're going to be the marketplace for startups. We're going to be the place you go. None of them have ever worked. These guys figured it out. I, I, Jason said it earlier. I go every day, I check that site. Jason was saying, it's the one thing he checks in the morning. He, un, he unfriended his mom on Facebook, but he checks the Vault site. They've just done a fantastic job. It was why we wanted him here, because they're, like everything else, they're all about capital efficiency. They're all about really driving this change. Hey, you want to come in and grab a seat? No, no, no. My, one Jenks, of my co uh, the co organizer of the of Note by, Summit. Staying behind the scenes. He's on a roll. So, I mean, obviously, he's, you know, we want to get some valuation numbers. What was Joyant's last round of valuation? It was no comment. <laughs> uh, okay, it well, was good, but it was no comment. All right, well, Charles Beeler, great investor, young gun in Silicon Valley, cornering the market, Node Summit here uh, by just having a great presence. Congratulations on putting this event together. Great vision. 
Uh, I know you worked hard. You guys are doing great with your fund. And uh, I know some it's really an important trend, so congratulations. And Thanks. And, and congrats on DevOps Angle. It's the, first, it's the first big online publication to really see this as the next wave and jump into it. As you know, it's a very different type of conversation than what you see on a lot of the sites, including some of the stuff you guys are driving now. I think it's it's very timely, yeah. and so we were thrilled to have you guys you know, want to yeah. come here and be part of it and launch it here, and uh, I can't think of a better place to do it or a better guy to do it with. Well, we'll continue to talk to you. Clint Finley will be heading up Ops Dev and DevOps, or whatever we're going to call it. It's actually called DevOps, but uh, it's kind of the industry term. But we're going to cover like a blanket. It does cross into the enterprise eventually. DevOps now is a developer market, so we do have services angle, which is pure old, you know, old school consulting, big yep. consulting business like Accenture, HP, and EMC, and those guys run huge huge services businesses, it's EDS and those guys, huge, huge business. DevOps is really kind of the emerging model, so very disruptive. Um, again, I call this category for Hurricane, this marketplace around Node, because it's, it's, it's ripping trees down and some building shingles are going off, but you know, it's not a category five yet, No, but it's, and, a, it's a four. And you know, um, the, the trees are being knocked down and there's some disruption. And the, and the community, if you talk to these guys, they don't want it to be a Category 5 today. Their, their biggest fear, I was just having a conversation with one of the core committers to Node, they do not want Node to be overhyped. And it's hard to avoid it, because it probably is. They don't want it to be all about hype. They want it to be about reality. And they would much rather take a slower paced growth effort here. I think they love that this is going on, but I think to some degree a little nervous. That does this expand it to a point where it's, it's ahead of its skis and they're trying to be really careful about that, which I applaud because it's a long-term approach. You, you heard Brandon Eich in there earlier talking about JavaScript and some of the things they're doing now. He said, these things don't change quickly. Give it time. Here's what we're working on. Here's what we're doing. And, and we're seeing the same thing with Node, which uh, in, in the long run will be good for everybody who's starting a company and trying to find a way to be more efficient as they develop things. What do you think about the, uh, the trending on Twitter? I mean, that was pretty impressive <laughs> yesterday that Node Summit was number three around, globally um, around this. So obviously there's an online community. Um, they, we all get what it means to have good I.O. and HTTP as a first class citizen in terms of the design side of the systems and apps yep. uh, architecture. I, I Well, first I was blown away. Um, clearly it shows that one, you guys have a ton of people watching it from here. There are a lot of people following it just using a hashtag who aren't, aren't at the conference itself. Uh, yeah, there, there are a few things interesting that happened yesterday that, that got a lot of attention. Probably the biggest one was Scott Guthrie, right? corporate VP of servers and tools at Microsoft. Phenomenally intelligent guy, very technical. Uh, comes on stage with a Mac, opens up a Chrome browser, and loads a, a Node.js application up into Azure. We, we sent out a tweet from Node Summit on that. It had, within 20 minutes, we had 45 people retweet it. Right? I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of interesting things that are happening here that I think have surprised a lot of people in the dev community, Microsoft being one of them, and I think that's helped a lot. But, but really, it just shows this is it's an interesting topic. It's a fun it, thing it, to talk it, about. It cuts across many layers organically as a community. It's growing very rapidly. It's got some disruption elements in the business side. And obviously, the big whale vendors like Microsoft, like HP and EMC, and, and uh, these big guys, even like SAP, will be impacted by this. So um, I love it. It's, it's, it's the San Francisco way, but it's not just San Francisco. It's global. No. We're seeing people from New York. We saw some Israel. We saw some UK. We're going to have a UK guy on here. Uh, it's just booming. So well, yeah, learn Node. Um, check out Node Summit, Pound Node Summit. And, but I was going to say, it says a lot about you know, you, Mark Lewis, right? Chief Strategy Officer of EMC at the time we decided this conference would be a good idea. It says a lot that someone in that role at a company like that would be looking at Node this early. I know Paul Martz, big believer in Node, was trying to be here to speak. Steve Harrod came from VMware instead. And there's some people who are paying a lot of attention to it, quietly observing it, but it's not lost on these big guys. And to their credit, they're, they're, they're speaking about it publicly, they're supporting it, and uh, I think it, it bodes well for the overall community as it continues to grow. Someone just stole my line on, on Twitter. Node.js is a gateway drug to MongoDB. I wrote Node.js is a gateway drug to Hadoop <laughs> on Monday. Yeah, we've got... Uh, uh, you stole my line. One well, of the Mongo the guys is going to, one of the TenGen guys is going to be here. Uh, we've talked about with next the future events, uh, really talking about some, some of the things you plug in around Node, and Mongo's obviously one of them. So 
uh, it, it, this is it goes back to the community thing. It's not just Node; it's everything around it. And so far, these guys have all well. Really I just hope well I just hope that uh, it just doesn't get mangled up by you know the big vendor whales trying to put the brakes on it. You know how it always is with the big vendors; they want to come in and kind of control it. So you know we're we're hoping that it continues to be a commercial success at the same time. The development side can pace with that. So uh, congratulations on all your work, Charles Beeler with El Dorado Venture Capital, one of many VCs here. I saw Insuk Ray from Rembrandt. Ventures, another great VC, friend of Silicon Angle. So thank you so much for all your support. Thanks, John. Um, and I appreciate it. So and again, thanks for be being back here. in five minutes with more interviews. The Cube is this conceptual box, if you will, and we bring people inside of the Cube and then we share ideas, but those ideas don't stay inside the Cube. We explode that idea. We allow that idea to grow and grow, and it does. So we really try to own the whole enterprise technology space. I mean, that's what we're all about. We take analysis, we take publishing, we take news, and we take live TV, and we combine it together in a product and share that with our community. No one's doing what we're doing. Uh, what we're doing, in my opinion, is the future of media, future of television, future of the internet. Video is an amazing, powerful product. So we work in what John and I talk about as a data model. People always say to us, well, how do you guys make money? We sell knowledge, we sell information, we sell data. So the problem that we, are, that we identified is about what we call big, fast, total data. Anybody can analyze a gigabyte of data. If you do 1,000 gigabytes, that's a terabyte of data. You take 1,000 terabytes, that's a petabyte of data. 1,000 petabytes, that's a zettabyte of data. So you are talking big data, lots and lots of data, and can you analyze it in real time as it comes in, right? The Cube is like we call ESPN of tech because we want to cover technology like ESPN covers sports. John has a great vision for what's going to happen next in tech. And so John is sort of that alter ego of mine that lets me see the future. We have a really amazing team of people that work with us. Michael Sean Wright, Mark Hopkins, you know, we've got Kim here today. We've got a team of people on our news desk uh, run by Kristen Nicole. So she has a team that help feed us the news of the day, what's happening, the analysis. We have a team of analysts, and they feed us information about what's happening. And then, really importantly, we have a community, a big community of, of many hundreds of contributors. We love technology, we love, we love the innovation, and that's what we do. We want to create a great user experience. And in order to do that properly, you've got to really, really prepare. The Cube for the past year that we've been in operation has been very, very successful. And uh, you know, companies do pay us to come here. I think the companies who have bring us in with the Cube get two things. They get a third party independent resource to provide knowledge to their audience who are seeking it, this demand for the, for the product. And also complements their existing media. Uh, we're here at an event and uh, you know, the company has their own TV organization and they have to pay a premium for that. So we complement that by offering a objective, organic, third party, independent analysis of the event. That's why the top executives come in here.
The Cube is a comfortable place. It's a place where people feel happy and are happy to share their knowledge with the world. And uh, we're happy to, to be ambassadors of, of that knowledge transfer. My entire career has been really built on relationships and talking to people and extracting knowledge from people, largely in a belly-to-belly -belly private forum. What theCUBE does is it explodes that to a huge audience. I mean, we've reached millions with theCUBE, and it's real time, it's live TV, so you've got to be quick on your feet, but you learn very fast, and then you iterate from that learning. So John and I play off of that, and we're constantly trying to up our game.
Hey, we're back at live in San Francisco at Node Summit. I'm John Furrier with SiliconAngle.com. I'm joined with Alex Williams, our managing editor of our enterprise uh, online publication. And uh, we're here talking about Node.js, Node Summit. It's a the inaugural conference around Node and the evolution of this phenomenon around I.O. Um, in San Francisco and changing kind of the developer landscape relative to cloud, mobile, a lot of success stories. And our guest is Theo Schlossnagel uh, from Omni IT, runs the Surge Conference. Welcome back to theCUBE. We had you on Strata. I think Dave, inter Dave Vellante interviewed you. Um, Strata is O'Reilly's big data conference, uh, which is coming up in February, which will be there with theCUBE as well this year again. And, uh, you know, big data and node kind of all play hand in hand, but at the end of the day, it's about infrastructure, it's about infrastructure IT, infrastructure as, as a service, service providers all across the board. Um, we were talking yesterday, Theo, around, uh, we haven't seen, we've seen this before, it's just old wine in a new bottle, however you want to look at it. Um, uh, DevOps uh, trend, you were talking and saying, hey, it's not really about DevOps, it's about ops in dev. Um, so, first, what's, What's your take on Node, and and why all the? Is it hyped up? Is it real? What's the what's going on here from your perspective? So my take on Node, uh, it's it's. Uh, I don't listen to that much hype, um, so I'm not sure if it's overhyped or underhyped. Um, all I know is that we found it pretty valuable. Um, we were able to save a lot of money, uh, reduce timeframes on projects. Um, we were able to prototype things and actually launch them into production in ways that, that we don't have to invest a lot in ongoing maintenance. So it's real, which I think is important. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's simplicity just uh, makes it a, a lot more consumable. So it's great. Our, our engineers, not so much front end, but a lot of our back engineers, back end engineers that write C++ and C and Perl, they're starting to write JavaScript just because it's it's easy. You've been around the block. You know you know infrastructure. You're we call it guru in, in our world, and, and you have a lot of experience and in platforms and IT. What what's your take on on this developer movement? It's it seems to be a new crossover from the front end to back end, and then it's got all the new new capabilities. What's what's new here? What's not new here? Or is it just wine in a new bottle? What's so, I mean, talk about DevOps or yeah, DevOps and, and in general. I think the so, I mean, I, I my bread and butter is building backend infrastructure systems. So I, I build system software um, from you know down in the the kernel level up to um, backend database technology and web server technology, um, and there are. Not so many new problems there. Um, they're interesting problems. Uh, there's a lot of history to them. There's a lot of computer science around them. Um, there are problems that front-end developers tend to not be uh, so intimately aware of. So now that we have front-end developers um, flexing their proverbial muscles in back-end code, I think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of ignorance there, um, and that's kind of dangerous. Um, those things can change just through education and, and awareness, but we see people who uh, don't understand the problems they're facing, uh, blindly solving them again, and making all the same mistakes that were made 15, 20 years ago is um, it, in those things. Is this due to issues with concurrency in Node? Largely due to issues with concurrency in, co in, in Node, but there are also things like I/O safety and system resiliency and robustness and all of those things that I mean, you're running your JavaScript code in a browser. It's not that you don't care about them; it's that the problems are different, and you're just, you're, you're just it's an unfamiliar terrain. So you need more computer science on the back end. You need to take some courses in systems programming and database programming, not not programming a database, but building a database. Um, uh, yeah, there's just more computer science aspects. How are you seeing these problems surface right now? Um, systems that are deployed um, that give the illusion of correct operation that basically turn around and screw you in the end. I mean, they, they, they crash, they break, they lose data. Um, there's just not the right um, acumen to the, the values that, that are so key in building back-end systems. Um, so people build stuff that's, that breaks. So we were talking yesterday about DevOps, and, and, and you were saying when, they, when the dev gets more ops, then we'll talk, and dev <laughs> saying, no, we're ops. So I, I thought that was pretty clever, and I think that's interesting because you know, it's hard to be a systems programmer. I mean, you got to go to school for it, get a degree in operating systems or whatever. It's just not, there's not many of them, right? So yeah. what are some of the things that you're seeing relative to those, those, uh, those stumbling blocks, if you will? 
So, I mean, I've talked about DevOps and, and a lot, and one of my taglines that I'm known for, I think someone called me Trollo Schlossnagel the, the other day, is, is I like that, that. I, is that I say DevOps is bullshit. And I mean, the reason I say that is actually so that people will pay attention, not so much that the movement is BS, right? It, it's, it's that there are a whole bunch of developers who tend to evangelize themselves more than, say, the, the, the blood in the mud systems administrator that's been managing these systems. They get that, I mean, the bastard operator from hell exists for a reason, right? Yeah. They're asked to do one thing, make systems run all the time. And they can never exceed expectations. It's not like they can run more than all the time, right? So um, it's a different culture. So now the engineering groups are saying, we have all these really good practices for managing projects and managing code and managing concepts and, 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 and the evolution of our software. Let's take all those brilliant ideas and help these ops guys who are just hopeless. Yeah. And that attitude, I mean, you can rephrase that in a really endearing way, <laughs> and, that, and that's not the way it's usually phrased. And the yeah. interesting part is the, a lot of ops people are very resistant to that because they see the other side of that coin. It's like, wow, you know what? I'm sure you know what you're doing, but your software breaks all the fucking time in my architecture. So you, your, your, your best practices clearly don't build software that's operational. So how about taking some of our operational mentality and putting it in your software engineering practices? And, and the only reason I say DevOps is bullshit is so that I, I make people aware that the pendulum has swung a little too far to one side, yeah. right? And it's both groups that can really benefit from each other. And we had someone on the cube yesterday quoted uh, ops as TNT. They blow things up. It was Oren from Heroku. And TNT stands for the no team. When you go to ops and you say, you know, can we do something? No. Don't take it to the no team. But in a way, the reality is, is that you know they have they are taken for granted. I mean, ops yep. has to run stuff, and when it breaks, shit happens, right? Right. You lose the, money, apps fail, customers aren't happy. Right. I mean, it's direct impact to the business. So the interesting part is that there are things that will break. There are things that are out of your control. There are physical constraints. There are you know systems constraints. Um, but then someone builds you a piece of software and gives it to you. Why does that get to break too? Right. I mean. The software is kind of a pure thing. You don't actually have to have broken software. And if it is broken, why can't I ask questions about how it's broken? Why is that software not instrumented to make my job easier? So, and, yeah. and those things are just missing a lot of times. So what are you seeing and you know, to, to make, what are you seeing out there that, you're, that, that would cause this balance, cause us to be more balanced? Do you see uh, any, uh, any, any this, signs of this balance? changing at all? Uh, this conversation. This um, conversation. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I talk at conferences a lot about um, about DevOps, um, and I, I, it's not that I don't believe in the angle that's usually presented, it's I'm presenting the other angle to make sure that it gets fair balance. I mean, I think pulling software engineering practices into ops is a great thing. Systems automation, all this stuff is awesome, um, but you can't lose sight of the fact that there are software engineers that really don't understand what having an operational zero downtime, no error, mentality is, is really about. So. Well, we, we're proud to launch DevOps Angle today. We just launched it on siliconangle.com. It's a section soon to be propagating from a URL to a URL, devopsangle.com. And, and it's important. A lot of people are talking about it because IT is a cost, in, in a way, operationally, is a lot of cost involved. I mean, you know, the old joke, 70% is to run the business and, you know, 30% to actually do any innovation. So people are trying to get the operational roles kind of trimmed down and efficient. So, you know, it's a challenge. And I, I think it's cultural. I mean, we used to call it network and software guys. It was that simple. You were a network guy and a software right. guy, you know, kind of like, oh, you know, screw you, you know, kind of thing. It was kind of war, cold war going on. Yep. Um, you know, so I think culturally, it has to come down from the top executives. Uh, and, and does that, as a CIO, I mean, in your experience, how do you go with these engagements with your, with customers and, and what are their, what, what's it like? I mean, do you walk in, the CIO says, okay, Theo, you guys got to just run the show or change these guys. I mean, what happens? Take us through the, that process. And do you think it's top down? It is, it, I mean, it's, it comes from both sides. It really depends on the engagement. Our engagements vary. Um, so we do a lot of strategic services um, where we're doing consulting. Some of it's from the bottom up where you have um, people on the, on the lower level, director of operations and down that, that, that can't meet their service level agreements and feel like they're put in a position where they can't succeed. And their feedback to upper management of, you know, I need more transparency across the organization. I need to be able to, you know, I'm enabling marketing. I don't get to see their KPIs. Right? Like, how am I supposed to enable them if I don't know if I'm actually enabling them? Um, and they're not being listened to, so we're pulled in to actually have that voice in a, 
in a, in a better way. And then sometimes we're pulled in by a CIO or CTO, sometimes CEO, to actually you know exert that sort of pressure and that sort of accountability across the organizations going down. So we're that's... here inside the queue with uh, Theo Sloshnagel, who's with Omni IT Systems Programmer Guru, runs the conference um, Surge. Um, What's next in this evolution, in your mind? Okay, you know, try to shoot the arrow forward a little bit. Your nodes here today, all those challenges that you mentioned are legit, real. What's going to happen? What do you see in the forecast? Of Maybe, the in, perhaps in context of the types of discussions you expect to unfold at Surge this year. So, it, Surge is a systems engineering conference. Um, so, we're really talking about um, building enormous systems uh, <laughs> and, and doing it wrong. And, and one of the things that I've learned over my career is that um, I can learn so much more from someone's failure than from their success. So really what I want is I want companies to come in and, and talk about how they had this grand idea, they did this research, they did this implementation, and they still have the scars, right? It didn't work. It, it, they, there were bad assumptions, there were, there were bad ideas, and to walk us through those steps. And if you, te if you do that and you have some good storytelling, you, you can walk away with that. So the conversations are really about failure in a lot of ways, um, and then uh, learning from those, those mistakes. And hopefully you can you know, get enough out of that conversation to, to not make the same mistakes. And the future for this community, what do you see this? Do you see it kind of meeting up to expect expectations? Uh, I, I don't know what the expectations of the Node community are. <laughs> um, the Node community is incredibly young, um, yes. and uh, the, the product is incredibly young. Um, but the potential that we've seen hands-on with it um, definitely tells us that there's a long life to it. Um, so I, I think what we're going to see is we're going to see the Node community growing up. Um, not as an, an insult that they're all immature, it's just that they, so there's a lot of growing up to do in this community and, 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 and feeling like, you know, where do we belong um, in, in sort of a service platform, delivery platform context? Uh, are we, are, do, do we power embedded devices? Do we power, you know, uh, control planes on networking equipment? Do we power API endpoints on the web? Um, there's a lot of talk here about uh, enabling mobile technology due to the, the architecture of Node. It really fits well with that. Um, we've seen that. We've used it for that. And uh, it's an exciting technology to be using in that space. Joint, joint would say everything's a Node. So yeah, why couldn't it encompass everything? I'm more pragmatic than that. Um, <laughs> uh, node is a way to tell a computer what to do. Um, yeah, yeah. All I want is a computer to do it. So Node is a means to an end. Um, there are other technologies that work really well, too. So this young community, there's a lot of young people who are who've learned JavaScript, mm -hmm. um, and, and PHP to some extent, I mean, that's a little, skews a little bit older. Is that becoming an, a reason why more companies are adopting Node.js? Because you, there are a lot of people who know JavaScript, there are a lot of people who know PHP. Um, I think there, there are a couple of different reasons. When you say PHP is older, God, you make me feel ancient. Um, so PHP wasn't around when I started. Um, so. <laughs> I, I was thinking like mid-20s <laughs> to late 20s. I'll, I'll try to remember what it feels like to be that <laughs> Whether, uh, Elementary uh, school, the teenager. <laughs> yes. Um, so, I mean, the, the adoption of Node.js, I mean, I think that the the scalability aspects, the fact that I can write a prototype for an application and actually have that scale to a, a reasonable level. I mean, it's not going to be the most high performance code in the world. It's not going to scale to infinity. Um, but I can get so much further than I used to be able right. to get in, in, a, in a scripting language like, like Python or Perl or PHP. Um, that's one thing. Um, the other, which I hear talked about a lot, um, that I only see a couple of companies actually embracing is the fact that I'm writing JavaScript code for the front end and for the back end and those things that are in common I don't have to write twice. Right. So I don't have cross implementation bugs um, that, that happen when you re-implement something in a separate language. Um, oh, I actually haven't personally experienced that utopia. Um, <laughs> we don't tend to run the same code on the back end and the front end. They, they, they tend to be somewhat separate um, because of the way our APIs run and, and almost every client we, we interface with. So I, those are the two reasons I hear, though. What have you seen here at Node Summit that um, caught you by surprise or surprised you in a way, in good and bad, around the content and the startups or anything here? Um, the people that I thought were running Node are not running it so much, and there are a lot of people running it that I had no idea were running it. So it's kind of a, in a, in a way, there are a lot of people that don't talk about their uses of products, and you have to catch them in the hallway track and engage them offline 
in a way where they'll open up about that. So I learned a whole bunch of really interesting uses of Node.js that weren't in the public eye and still aren't. Like what, what? Like what example? Um, so the, um, the, the infrastructure components, um, the Rackspace guys are, are running Node.js for, for deployment platforms. Um, the, uh, the, the Walgreens stuff was actually really interesting. I thought the Walgreens um, interesting. guys talked about their use of Node on, on both sides of the, the platform is, I mean, they're doing really interesting.